Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? In today's episode, we're going to talk about how to overcome blanks in women's history and prehistorical goddess worship. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get into this. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, The Other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. Episode 17. 17. Mwah. I mean, that's impressive. Yeah. Anyways. Blanks and goddess worship. Okay. Okay. So, what do you mean by blanks? Blanks. So, lots of women are less left out of the historical record, okay? Um, their stories, their ideas, their opinions are not recorded. And so, a lot of times, historians venture into not history. Okay. I need more. If you... if So, if something happens, uh-huh. you know a woman was there, and then you have to imply or guess... Oh, of what happened with what her? What her thoughts were about that. Now you're not in history anymore. Right? Well, you're... You're guessing. Some would say lying. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll go with guessing or fabricating the truth. <laughs> well, you are... You're taking your best guess. You're taking your best guess. It's an educated hypothesis based on what you know. Okay. But that's a very dangerous place to be as a historian because... You don't know, right? <laughs> and we know that history changes depending on who's writing the exactly, history. Exactly, yeah. So dep- And depending on the error that you're looking back and what lens you're looking back. There's a lot. Right. So there's a lot of women historians that are warning other women historians. About doing this? About guessing too much. Okay. Because... We live in a post-feminism world. We live in a world where women have the right to vote. We live in a world where um, anybody who doesn't have feminism, the right to vote, the right to speak freely in public, Mm, those people are oppressed, backwards, behind. Well, that's a very blanketed statement. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. So so then is that is that true? Is that how women in 1766 might have felt? Did they feel oppressed when X, Y, or Z happened? Yeah. Who knows? Right? And we don't know what they what they thought unless they wrote it down. Okay. And so the problem with women's history and one of the reasons why it doesn't get taught mainstream is because there's a lot of guessing. Yeah, and so how do you start with this venture? Oh, you that's that is the question, Brooke. <laughs> that is the question. What do you what do you got cooking over there, Kelsey? How do you start with this? Well, so I'm actually I'm not gonna answer the question because I don't really know. I'm looking to other women historians to kind of guide me. Kelsey searches for her book. <laughs> narrows focus. Has a lot of things underlined. Yeah, too many things. So this will be difficult. One of the women whose books I've read is a woman named Rosalind Miles. She wrote The Women's History of the World, which is, well, it's not a very thick book. So I feel like she... It's about two cheese crackers and a pepperoni. Cheese crackers (laughs) and a pepperoni. That's the size and width. Yeah. So it's not a very (laughs) thick book. So how it can be the history of the world concerns me a little bit. But... Um, on page 15, she says, with a subject of this magnitude, there could be, there could have been as many different histories as there are women to write them. This book does not try to be comprehensive, nor does it purport to have solved all the problems of writing women's history. One of those problems being blanks, right? Right. Yeah. Many will feel that they could have done better. Please try. We need as much women's history as we can get. This version makes no pretense to the traditional historical fiction of impartiality. So she says right out front. I'm not trying to be impartial here. Accordingly, as with any work on women, some good old boy somewhere is bound to object that it is unfair to men. There is no better reply to this than the spirited self-defense of the pioneer women historian Mary Ritter Beard. There is sure to be an overemphasis in places, but my apology is that when conditions have so far been lo- have so long been weighted too much on one side, it is necessary to bear down heavily on the other. Boom. I mean, so what she's saying here is that men have always been talked about. Women are not. 
If someone has a problem with that, come see her. Yep. <laughs> and if <laughs> the example is Mary Wooden Beard. Ritter. Ritter Beard. We talked about her. Yeah. She's one of the first women historians. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So she goes on to talk about, you know, these blanks are a part of women's history. And that yeah. the job of the woman historian is to infer what that means. And that's just really challenging. Yeah. I mean, especially we're all human. We all have our own biases. We all have our own lens of where we come from. Right. We're going to infer till the cows come home of what we think is possible. Yeah. You, I mean, obviously you can take your best guess of if you have, you know, the details and the resources. Sure. Yeah. But a lot of times it's hard when you're trying to put your foot down, like Mary Ritter Beard yeah. said, and you're trying to put emphasis where emphasis has not previously been. Right. Are you putting too much emphasis on something? I don't know that that can be the case. I mean, if there wasn't any emphasis to begin with. Right. Like, it's basically like, oh, it, there's a log cabin with no windows, and I just added some windows. Yeah. Are there too many windows? Yeah. I can't tell. Well, there was none before. There were none before. <laughs> so another woman historian, Cynthia Eller. Uh, we're going to talk about these two women a lot tonight. So Okay. Cynthia Ellard. Eller. Eller, yep. And Rosalind Miles. Okay. And Cynthia Eller, in her book, talks a lot about historical inference. Her book is two cheese crackers and four pepperonis. <laughs> She says, it's really hard to measure the treatment of women from culture to culture because what one culture deems as oppression, another could deem as liberation. And I feel like a really good example of this could be Islam. And yeah, that hijab. was exactly what I was just thinking in my mind. I'm like, well, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, in the West... The veiling and covering of women's bodies, many in the West see as this is the way, you know, we are protecting women from from the wandering eyes of men who are yeah. sexual beings and blah, blah, blah. In the West, we're kind of at a point where we're trying to say, like, no, men need to be responsible for their themselves. sexuality and themselves and let women do their thing. And... um in the Mideast and other places where, you know, North Africa, where Islam is practiced widely, mm -hmm. the hijab and the covering of women is seen as their liberation, right? Right. From, um, from the male's world, right? Just be who you are. Let your intellect thrive and, like, don't who cares worry about what, you what look you're wearing. Like, yeah. yeah. What you look like shouldn't matter. Um, it should not be a measure of your worth. And, and there's they, some argument to that. Yeah, like, and there, I think I've heard someone saying this. Like, there was a woman in one of my grad classes that I was um, talking to, and she wore a hijab. And so she, am I saying that right? Yep. Um, and she said, we feel sad for Americans because men objectify them at every opportunity, and that doesn't happen in our culture. Yeah. And it was like, what? Yeah. It just, like, exploded my mind. Yeah. Yeah, how cool is that? It was such a crazy experience to, like, yeah. even talk to her about that, but, like, how they look down on us, and we we always are, you know, the women that you talk to, you're like, oh, no, how sad for them they can't show their face. It's, like, how liberating for them yeah. that they don't have to. Right. Anyways. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so I think that's a really good example. So she takes takes this sort of modern example, and she mm -hmm. says, so if we can't even understand different cultures— now, when we can talk to each other. Yeah. How on earth can you infer the implications of something that happened in history if you don't even have a written record to go off of? So she wrote a whole book about it. Yeah. And <laughs> how did she approach it? So she was compelled to, as a woman historian, based on theories that other women historians were writing about okay related to prehistory so can we infer she was a little grumpy about these other women and had to take up the charge yes <laughs> so before we get into her grumpiness okay let us 
talk about the theory that she is not pleased with. Okay. All right. Okay. So Rosalind Miles is a proponent of this theory in her book, The the Women's History of the World. But she is one of many women who are proponents of this theory and men who are proponents of this theory. And the theory is in prehistory, so before written record, before language, women were worshipped. So what evidence do they have to support this theory? (laughs) Let's hear it. Okay. So first of all, Around the world, um, around Europe in particular, Germany, modern-day Germany area, mm-hmm. they have found um, lots of Venus figurines. Okay. Venus figurines are these little pagan figurines that people would worship. And um, they are uh, the body of a woman, but it is as voluminous and womanly as <laughs> humanly possible. I mean, the rolls and the breasts are like... Present, okay? And they have found these figurines all over Europe. Okay. Okay? So not the Virgin Mary. Not the Virgin Mary. Opposite. The nude opposite. Nude opposite. Virgin and that Mary. the widespreadness of these figurines has people perplexed. That's interesting. Why were so many female goddesses being worshipped. So it was like the Barbie of the time. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Um, And then, of course, in lots of different cultures, in India, in um, the Mideast, in Mesopotamia, there are um, goddesses like Ishtar that are being worshipped. Okay. um, And they are these very powerful goddesses whose femininity and body and um, celebration of birth is very present in their depictions left over okay. by early peoples. Um, Can other, I just pause you? I've been yeah. waiting for you to say Mesopotamia for Mesopotam- 17, 17 episodes. Yeah, and? <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> so, um, so, other parts of the theory that are compelling. Women are capable of birth, and there's some evidence that perhaps our uh, prehistoric ancestors, the Mm -hmm. hominids, maybe didn't know... (laughs) Hominids. Hominids. Early humans. Got it. Okay? Like, pre-homo erect... You know, like, all... Like, go back to homo... Pre-hairier people. Hairier. Knuckle dragon. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, That maybe they weren't as aware of cause and effect... Especially something as long term as birth. Okay. So you have sex, and then nine months later, a woman gives birth. But they didn't know that sex caused birth. Perhaps. Okay. Interesting. And then the other thing that's crazy about women is that their entire like menstrual cycle aligns with, with the, moon? the moon. How earthly and magical is that? Men can't do that. Another thing that's really fascinating about this theory of prehistoric goddess worship is that women bleed every month with the moon, and they don't die. I mean, it's pretty mythical. Pretty magical. Yeah. And so um, there's some evidence that early humans exhibited magical thinking about the world, and this is just one of those manifestations that might have resulted in goddess worship. Another really interesting thing about goddess worship is that there are lots of creation stories out there. Mm -hmm. And in almost all of the creation stories, the story, which is probably something passed down in that culture over time, begin with birth of some sort, Mm -hmm. begin with a woman of some sort. And and even in, like, the Bible, it's, uh, this is a very infery woman reading but <laughs> in <furry. laughs> yeah that's not a word but we'll take it um it begins with a vast opening a gap aka a vagina okay i mean i'm with you and from that i'll earth, allow it ex- earth appears and so in almost all of the stories at some point the woman is put in her place and the man or an all-powerful male god takes over and Some people think that in early history, and that these creation stories are evidence that in early history, woman was in power and man took over. 
I mean, ladies, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> so what did happen? Some people think that what happened was cause and effect. The understanding that paternity and birth, it's not this magical thing that women do. It only happens if man does something. Okay, so they figure this out. Yep. I mean, okay. Then how do we determine this? How do how do we know this? How do we know this? So that is the question. Okay. It's, it's taking things like figurines. It's taking things like um, grave sites, which are preserved, right? It's things that people are buried with. So all anthropology. All anthropology. Trying to figure out and trying to infer what all these things meant about the relationship Gosh. of the people to their gods. There's a thousand ways you could probably go wrong with that. Absolutely. The theory is pretty compelling, and I want to read a little bit about um, what Rosalind Miles says. Let's just say if someone digs up my old Barbies in the yard, they'll definitely have a different story. (laughs) What was Brooke doing with these Barbies? Did she have an older brother? Well, several of them are headless. (laughs) So Rosalind Miles says on page 38 of her book, The sacred status of womanhood lasted for at least 25,000 years. Some commentators would push it back further still, to 40,000 or even 50,000. In fact, there was never a time at this stage of human history when woman was not special and magical. Woman became both the focus and vehicle for the first symbolic thought. The French archaeologist uh, Leroy Gorhan solved a riddle of the early cave paintings that had defeated anthropologists of more puritanical cultures when he revealed that the recurrent and puzzling double-eye figure was a symbol of the vulva. Similarly, in a remarkable sculpted uh, frieze of animal and human figurines, the female forms were represented by pure abstract triangles of women's bodies with the sexual triangle prominently emphasized. How did women assume from the first this special status? One source of it was undoubtedly her moon-linked menstruation, the mystery of her non-fatal yet incurable emission of blood. Another was her close and unique relation to nature, for as gathering gave way to planned horticulture, women consolidated their central importance as the principal food producers. But the key really lies where the exaggerated breasts and belly of the earliest images of women direct us to look. In the miracle of birth. Before the process of reproduction was understood, babies were simply born to women. No connection was made with intercourse. To this day, Australian Aboriginals believe that spirit children dwell in pools and trees and enter any woman at random when they wish to be born. Men, so it seemed, therefore, had no part in the chain of generation. Only women could produce life, and they were revered accordingly. All the power of nature and over nature was theirs. So arose the belief that woman was divine, not human, gifted with the most sacred and significant power in the world, and so was born the worship of the Great Mother. The birth of new life out of woman's body was intricately related to the birth of crops out of the body of earth, and from the very first were interlocked in the concept of a female divinity far more complex and powerful than conventional accounts suggest. So in India, Mata Devi is the traditional mother, depicted as squeezing milk for humankind from her ample breasts. But other creation myths, as far apart as Assyria and Polynesia, had the Great Mother delivering not a race of men and women, but one mighty once and for all world egg. And in Greece, the most sacred climax of the secret mysteries of Elysius, the goddess, or her earthly representation, yearly gave birth to a sheaf of corn in an explicit link between woman's fertility and nature as archetypal Mother Earth. I love everything about that. It just shows, like, how prevalent a woman was in society and the myth that goes along with her in that time period is really interesting. But also, there was no science to, like, there was no science to be a barrier. Right. So it was just like, yes, these magical things are happening. Must be godly. Must be godly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a pretty fascinating theory. And when I first read it, I was like caught up in my world of, well, why haven't I heard of any women in history? And so, of course, it makes sense that 
I wouldn't have heard of any women in prehistory. Yeah, I mean, I guess that that would make sense. But, I mean, just being an English major, we talk about a lot of, like, you know, Odysseus. Like, when you're saying some of these things, it's like, oh, I've heard of some of these different eras, but it was always male-driven. Right. You know, Zeus was all-powerful. or right. You know, so. But was he? Because yeah. in her book, she talks about how Zeus assumes power in the story right. later. And so he's another example of sort of overthrowing either an egalitarian or a female-oriented goddess, god structure. It makes me mad that I don't know that history. Yeah. So one thing that I teach my students to do okay. is to always look at the historical context of all the sources that they're reading. And this book that I'm reading from, The Woman's History of the World, was published in 1989. Okay. This is not new scholarship. And since then, she is among a whole horde of people who have published and written about this theory. theory. Okay. Gloria Steinem, uh, not excluded. Uh, Gerda, Lerner, uh, Gerda Lerner, um, a very prominent woman historian um, and women, uh, gender studies um, you know, professor. Her book is used in women's history classes okay. all across the country. Um, and among others. And so um, this theory has been popularized since the feminist movement of the 1970s and 80s. And according to our girl, Cynthia Eller, it is a myth. Interesting. So, so when was her book published? 2000. Okay. More recently. So she's more recent. <clears throat> so but I'm imagining now, in, in 2020, we have people living on both sides of that camp. Yes. And so what a great historical inquiry. Oh. Mm. I love a good cat fight. Yes. <laughs> so, Brooke, we're going to take a short break. No. And we'll be right back. All right. <laughs> For lesson plan ideas and how to teach women's history, visit our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Remedial Herstory. If you think what we're doing is needed, please consider joining our Patreon community. Patreon allows you to sponsor a podcast with a small donation. Patrons get access to bonus materials, extended episodes, insider information, and gear. Give at whatever level you can. Patrons who give at the $25 tier will receive a Remedial Herstory mug and a booklet of all the Remedial Herstory lesson plans and resources. This episode is sponsored by our patrons. Thank you to Kent and Jamie Heckel from Ohio, Sarah Reardon from New Hampshire, Leah Tanger from Connecticut, and Bridget Erlinson from Connecticut. You guys make this show possible. Welcome back, Brooke. Good, we're back. Okay. <laughs> Let's get into this battle. This battle. So, Gerda Lerner is a prominent woman historian. That's just like, that's the hardest name to it's say. Very you hard. like nailed it. Thank you. Gerda Lerner. Gerda, Gerda, Gerda. Um, <laughs> you know what it sounds like is the chef from yes. the Muppets. Uber, duber, duber, duber. So I know her as a woman historian. Okay. And I was reading my student's AP World history textbook the other day, and I noticed that she was cited in okay. the textbook, and I got really excited. And she cited uh, related to prehistory. So in this book on, um, this is my uh, Ways of the World AP, US, uh, AP World History textbook. I mean, so inventive on the title. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it says, um, it talks about how uh, women played, it talks a lot about hunters and gatherers from, you know, prehistory period and the... People got to eat. People got to eat, and so they follow <laughs> the food, right? Um, this whole page, page 43, talks about the centrality of women in prehistory and how women um, were the gatherers, and gatherers, we are pretty sure, um, per produced more food than the hunters did and so that would be incredibly valuable because hunting was scarce and rare whereas the gathering was reliable and consistent and so well and controllable and controllable i mean you knew what you were planting reap what you sow if yeah. you yeah know. 
um, in this in this book, they talk about how because of that, women and men probably were equal, if not um, women being more valuable, value, more yeah. valued. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. And um, and so they say they use the the sort of scapegoat phrase relative equality. Um, which is giving Ugh. reasonable doubt. You if know? someone ever tells me that I'm relatively equal to something else, <laughs> you can take that and sit on it. Um, there is some evidence that in some of these cultures, they were matrilineal. And so... I'm uh, sorry. What? An inheritance <laughs> is passed down from mother to daughter. Oh, instead okay. Instead of father to son. What is it called if it's father to son? Uh, patrilineal. Just checking. <laughs> you uh, aced that. Thank uh, you. I'll look it up later. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, these are just other bits of evidence that have become very mainstream that show women's position in prehistory. Okay. Um, there was an article published by Jared Diamond in um, the mid-20th century. And um, in that article, he talks about how it's highly likely that women invented agriculture. And this is consistent in my AP is textbook. Is Jerry Diamond a historian himself as well? He's a historian. Okay. And, um, and so, and the evidence being that women are primary gatherers. And so figuring out how planting and seeds work would probably be more likely something they did than men did. Well, doesn't that equate to the the same thought process that women were more of the caretaker, medicinal uses for, you know, plants and vegetables and things to be a primary caretaker? Totally. Um, And then he goes on to talk about how the invention of agriculture created all the hierarchy structures that we know today because now you have surplus grain and that grain needs to be categorized and there need to be priests that determine who gets what grain, how much of that grain gets sacrificed to the gods, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm, We mm -hmm. have the first language systems coming about to keep track of the grain to um, that type of thing. And so this leads to civilization, at least a language and civilization. So you're saying women started civilization. Yes. <laughs> and I think that is something that perhaps ba- based on like happenstance is not really something that people argue too much with. Okay, so that's not in the battle between Well, it could be, but it's not really related to goddess worship. Mm-hmm. It's just contributing details that okay. sort of show that women had a status then that later generations of women might not have had okay. or didn't have, actually, we know from historical record. So, oh, I didn't even mention that agriculture and consistent food supply meant that women didn't have to move as regularly. Right. That birth was more regular and women gave birth much more frequently over the course of their lifetime. So, oh. so when you went from being a uh, hunter gatherer to being a civilized person you actually gave birth more so your domestic responsibilities and the children that you needed to rear and and breastfeed went up and okay. um and so that also could what about life expectancy the, do we know if it was longer or shorter life expectancy in a lot in some ways goes up and in some ways goes down because okay. when you centralize people you also deal with disease right when population you are reliant on a food source and you have a drought season, okay. that can be really problematic. And so um, it would take more, techmo- more technology um, over centuries for people to perfect agriculture okay. um, to make that consistent. So in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Gotcha. So these are all contributing factors into the question of were women equal if not superior to men in the past and so so we know what side of the fence do you live on well (laughs) let me lay out cynthia eller's okay attack on it and then you have to answer my question okay i'll try (laughs) (laughs) so she starts her book out this is called the myth of the matriarchal prehistory why an invented past won't give women a future i mean much 
better title than a previous book we just listed, but um, Little Wordy. Little Wordy. Um, both of these women, uh, Rosalind Miles and Cynthia Eller, are feminists. Both of them uh, want women presently to be empowered. And okay. And yet they have very different theories on women's pasts. Cynthia Eller spends a lot of time in the beginning of her book basically being like, when I first started hearing these theories, it made me feel really good. Well, as yeah, a woman. it's like here's lovely. A, here's a time in the past where women were badass, they were worshipped, they were goddesses, they were powerful. I mean, yeah, let's all go back to that time well, period. That's amazing. I mean... Maybe a little more technology, but I get what you're saying. She didn't really understand, though, as a student, why teachers and professors would talk about matriarchal societies. Because the impact that it had on women presently was laughter. And she shared a story about studying in Greece and um, the tour guide uh, talking about how one of the cultures um, there was matrilineal and um, and all the people around her laughed. And it made her feel awful. Because that is awful. It, yeah, and what an awful experience to have to go through, whether it's historically accurate or not. Yeah. And that was the impact it had as a young student in the 60s and 70s, you know, as the feminist movement is, is really kicking off. And so she kind of was, like, not trusting and very skeptical as this idea, this this theory about goddess worship is gaining traction among feminists in the 70s and okay. 80s. And so she she's very skeptical. She talks about how it's kind of weird to disprove a theory when really the pressure should be on the people promoting the theory to prove it yeah to prove it rather than her to disprove it but, but she, if it's becoming more popular and well rooted then i imagine she has the uphill battle at this point right and in fact it's everywhere and she talks about all the random places in pop culture she's seen this theory referenced and mentioned oh, what <laughs> and so she has a really hard time battling the theory so these are some of her arguments that she lays out against the theory okay. she says first Historical method. What's that? We don't guess when there are blanks. That's a poor methodology for a historian. Okay, all right. Okay. She says, second, how ironic that this is becoming a feminist thing. Because in the 1800s, this theory of goddess worship was used by male historians to justify the patriarchy in a time when women... Ugh. Yeah. So they look, these historians in that time period, um, 1861, one man, Johann Jacob Bakofen. All right, well, you don't have to yell at us about right, it. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Johann. Anyway, Johann um, was, wrote about how this was a... The, the rise of the patriarchy was a necessary evolution over matriarchies, that they were inferior and that male dominance, hierarchy, capitalism, um, you know, had this uprising. So I feel like time for tables to turn. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> well, he so he's saying this is justification for male superiority, which over is women. awful. Yeah. Okay. So she's saying, why are we trying to jump on this bandwagon of promoting this theory that men have used to put women further down? Yeah. Right? Bad idea. Um, she also says, this is not a time to jump into pseudoscientific things, because if we want to play in the male world, we have to use the male systems of science and historical accuracy and do, rationality. Do we, though? <laughs> do we? I mean, have we not used them long enough? We have, um, but she's saying that we're not going to gain, gain any, any credibility okay. um, for the women's movement. So beat them at their own game. Yeah, beat them at their own game. Let's play this game. Let's talk women's history, and let's actually use historiography to back that up. All right, you're using a lot of big words in this episode. I feel like I need a dictionary. <laughs> historiography? <laughs> historiography is like like how the study of history, like how like oh. how we study it and how we um how I feel we like you're just putting ography on something for fun. Yeah. But that's It's a great thing to do. It'll make you sound <laughs> real smart, you know. I'm looking at a phonography and a bookography. 
<laughs> and a hairography. Oh, that is a nice hairography. I Thanks, like I showered today. Uh, lovely. <laughs> you should keep that up. I mean, you're welcome. <laughs> Um, she also says that the theory really oversteps the historical evidence, or rather archaeological evidence, because what a lot of people are saying is like, okay, so we've had two, three, five thousand years of a patriarchy. Yeah. Right? And they're like Rosalind Miles was saying that there was at minimum twenty five thousand years of matriarchies at min at minimum. Okay. And then she goes on, it could be double that fifty thousand, wow. right? And so she's saying like, whoa, 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 where like that? Like you're you're overreaching to the point of exaggeration. <laughs> okay. And so that doesn't really help the cause of yeah. Like take it down a few. Take it down a few. Yeah. Um. So. One of the things that I thought was really interesting is she does talk about how the theory is appealing because it centers Africa and it centers the environment and the earth and nature in the history of humankind because women are so closely tied to To the earth. And in prehistory, you know, the evidence shows that we all evolved out of Africa and and, and emigrated from there. Um, Okay. And so... So that sort of puts Africa at the center of the history. And the history of the fall of the matriarchies is also the fall of Africa, right? And the sort of rise of the Greco-Roman okay. Middle Eastern world. Um, and so so that's those are all appealing things, right? To give some um, focus on Africa in, in courses and, um, to talk about environmentalism and how things were, um, more sustainable under these matriarchies and under, um, the hunter gatherers. Okay. But, um, I guess I always try and bring it to current. Are there still cultures in Africa that are matriarchal? Am I yes. saying that right? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that still a thing? Uh, there are some, I'm not familiar with like all of them. Okay. Um, but yeah, there are cultures around the world that are that true that are matriarchal. There are they, some are matrilineal. The other word that all we're right. using, <laughs> matriarchal, Killing meaning me. the hierarchy structure is built around women. Matrilineal, meaning that's how we also okay. pass down things. We don't have in um, in the United States. We don't have a matrilineal or patrilineal society because women can inherit money from their parents now. Right. Right. So it's not like. Like, that's not really it doesn't, a term It doesn't skip to me know. and go to my son. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. She also talks about what we were talking about at the beginning of the episode, which is how can we even begin to infer about what people in those times meant by this, that, or the other thing when we're separated by thousands of years? And I mean, couldn't we try? <laughs> we can absolutely try, but she says She's it's saying a it's... really dangerous thing for archaeologists, for anthropologists, yeah. and historians to get into. And she makes some really um, forward-thinking arguments uh, um, related to this. So... Um, Give me one, because I feel like she's just a little whiny. She's kind of point. a naysayer, definitely. Yeah. And like, a naysayer in a theory. You published an entire book about how I got it wrong. Like, what? What's your? What's your got? What yeah. You got? Totally. So she says many feminist anthropologists have been loath to see and name sexism in other cultures in places where they would find it on their own. Or conversely, they emphasize women's status and autonomy in other cultures in forms they would not recognize as such in their own turf. She goes on to say, individuals can enjoy and appreciate their lives while still being in structurally disadvantaged positions relative to others, which I thought was a kind of compelling idea. Okay. She says, um, some go so far as to argue that women and men do not exist anywhere except as cultures create these categories. So if... Anthropologists start saying, well, this person was buried with a spear, and this person also had male genitalia. That means that this person was, that this culture valued warfare as a fundamentally male. Yeah, it's a big leap. Right? Those are big jumps, right? Maybe they were buried with a spear, and that has a completely different meaning. Because their mom not, made it for them. Because their mom made it for them <laughs> as a wedding present. To their husband. To, yeah. 
Sure. Hey, let's, let's throw all the culture in there. Yeah, <laughs> right? And so we're making a lot of assumptions about gender stereotypes from our time, about war being male and other things being female, that, that maybe those things weren't there in their time. Um, okay. She talks about the reading of gender, and I thought you would appreciate this. Kelsey, I always appreciate it. What do you got? She says, <laughs> skeletons can be sexed as male or female within a margin of error and then examined in order to draw tentative conclusions about women's and men's diets, life expectancy, and patterns of work based on bone de uh, degeneration, tooth wear, and mineral content in the bones themselves. Grave goods, if they differ between male and female skeletons, may also offer clues to prehistoric gender, and some paintings and sculptures give clear evidence of sex. But beyond this, it's impossible, at least without historical or ethno-historical support, to know which artifacts go with which sexes. Even the most basic question, who makes those weapons, who uses those grinding stones, cannot be answered definitively through the pre-literate material record alone. I mean, you can't look at someone's hand and be like, they held this. Right. That's just not how it works. Right. You don't know that. And so you're making a lot of assumptions in there. Um, she goes, attributions like this are inevitably controversial. Recently, it has been even more difficult to make arguments about prehistoric gender based on sex skeletons. For if there is concern that a biological female may have been a social man, trans, right? Why? And how do you know that? So if a female is buried with, with a male sphere, items, yeah. Right? Maybe, so we might draw conclusions that these were some sort of Amazon women, right? <laughs> <laughs> but maybe they weren't. Maybe that person was male and carried that spear like all the other men did. Right? It's hurting my brain, Kelsey. Right. So what a fascinating, what a fascinating kind of takedown. And and it almost puts the theory in its place to try to gender everything. But yet we're Well yeah, it's like basically stop gendering things. Yeah. And look at it different. Like it's spin it on its head and try it another way. Yeah. I mean Essentially, everyone's, it's a theory. We're never going to know the true, you know, factoid of any of it because we have no writings. We have no story. We have no first person account. Right. And then even evidence from the material record suggests otherwise. So a large part of the theory is based on this idea of magical thinking. And this idea that maybe people didn't really understand how birth worked mm -hmm. um, and women's bodies worked and menstruation and all of those things. And she said that there are cave paintings that suggest that prehistoric people were aware of the relationship between sexual intercourse and conception. A paleolithic pa cave painting depicts uh, animals mating, pregnant, and giving birth in such a way that these events seem connected. Okay. A plaque from a different area carved uh, with a gray cyst shows two figures in an embrace on the left and a mother and child on the right, an artifact which some, including some feminist matriarchalists, uh, read as visual texts on the results of copulation. So these are prehistoric cave paintings that show that these people understood birth and how it worked. So not magical anymore. So not magical. So that kind of takes the theory down a notch. Mm, you're making me sad. I know. Because you <laughs> want to believe it. I do. I want it. I want the other one. Yeah. You want that to be true. That there was this time, this magical utopian time. That before. women were held on a pedestal and felt as if they had something more powerful than men. Yeah. One of the things about the theory that is um, really interesting is is all the ways that it genders women. It talks a lot about the nurturing, mothering role that women yeah. played. And many of the goddesses that we do know about and do have historical records about, they weren't nurturing and mothering no, people. No, they were like feared and evil and yep. cursing. Anat from, Ca from Canaan. Uh, she says, she is filled with joy as she plunges her knees into the blood of heroes. The Sumerian 
uh, Inanna is also the goddess of war, and significantly, neither she nor Anat is portrayed as a mother. <laughs> Shitala, worshipped today in Bengal, tempts fallible persons and especially mischievous children with irresistible delicacies, which then break out on their bodies as horrifying and fatal poxes. Acne. So these are evil women <laughs> who tempt children and abuse them and are goddesses of war. Interesting. To me, that isn't necessarily, that last bit, isn't necessarily evidence that the theory is wrong entirely because it's talking about yeah. women in power, and mm -hmm. those are very powerful goddesses. Yeah, and, and strong imagery, too, of, of what they believed in in that time. Yeah. Okay. So, you asked me... Yeah, what side of this fence do you live on? And then I want to know, how do I get this into a classroom? Yeah. So, I am, like you, sad. I <laughs> okay. was... I was over here all alone. No, I'm very sad. <laughs> okay. When I first heard the theory, I read, I read it in this book. A woman's so, you history. read that one first? I read that book. And because... And the reason it came up is because I'm searching for women's history. And it's right. one of the top hits on Amazon. So I got the book, and I was floored. I was devastated that I had never heard this before. Okay. And um, then I started looking into it, and it's repeated in other famous women history books. Okay. Um, and so now I'm sold. I'm convinced. I'm seeing support in mainstream things like my AP textbook. Okay. I'm seeing support. Kool-Aid drinking. You yeah. are uh, You're there. I'm with it. And... Um, this book, sadly, this myth, this, this taking down of, of the story, of the theory, um, the myth of matriarchal prehistory, um, this book came up only very recently in my okay. research. And I found it first as like a scholarly article and I read it and I, I didn't buy into it. And I think part of it, part of the reason I did Because you were so invested in I the other. I was so invested in the theory and um, and I didn't believe her because she really doesn't get into the nitty gritty of her argument until many chapters later in right. the book. And her introduction is super vague. It's sort of just like, yeah, well, it's not really like history. And that's sort of how <laughs> she starts. And it's like, well, yeah, it's prehistory. It's anthropology, yeah. right? And so I, I didn't really buy her argument. But I think the more I think about, you know, what is it we're really trying to teach students and what is critical this really thinking. about? It should be about critical thinking. It should be about evidence and it should right. be evidence based. And the evidence that is compelling about the theory is the theory, but it's all theory, right? This it's, idea yeah, it's like shoddy at best. It's shoddy at best. This idea that women can bleed and not die, right? That's that, that if you. If you accept the, the, the premise that people followed magical thinking, yeah. may not have understood cause and effect, then you can follow the theory the rest of the way to this idea that they might not understand birth, they might not oh, understand Oh, yeah, so if, like, that's, a, that's where you're starting from, then, yeah, then all of it can blow up. But if you're starting from a place where they did understand those things, then you blow it up the other way. Right, exactly. Hmm. So... History classes are notorious in not including women. And I was sad in learning about this theory to first learn that agriculture is pretty universally yeah. okay. attributed to women. That um, even people, you know, in, in mainstream are pointing to agriculture really as... A, a turning point in the lives and experiences of women in how many children they give birth to in yep. the movement of women into the domestic sphere god goddesses that probably were not worshipped as you know the mother goddess right, right. Like the theory um, suggests but as pagan goddesses sure. used to be in public settings and over time are gradually moved into domestic spheres and so women like the goddesses that are female are often worshipped on the hearth rather than the male gods which are worshipped in public places like right. church okay and so those sort of things people are talking about and that is that is real. Um, and I think, you know, another compelling bit is how, you know, 
most monotheistic religions, right? First of all, we went from having many gods that included women right. to having one god that was male, right? Yep. Our Lord, our Father, He with a capital H, right? He has these these feelings. And that is sort of evidence that there at least was some sort of equality among gods, right? Where there yeah. were many of them and, you know, creation at least began with multiple figures being involved to now we have God, the Almighty, who created Earth on yeah. his own, right? No help, no help. So those, I think, are, are evidence at least that some sort of transition in the status of women or at least in the status of gods occurred. Right. Um, and and so I do, I mean, I still obviously am like clinging a little bit to the theory, but I understand that the theory falls apart when it comes to that prehistoric archaeological record because mm-hmm. they really have to demonstrate, you know, the the history that we do have shows that across the world, in most areas, the patriarchy exists. Right. So to suggest that it never existed, you need some evidence to back that up. And it's almost like the pressure is on the matriarchy, not the other way around. Sounds that way, which is frustrating. Yeah. So... I have created a lesson plan using these two sources. Okay. Students will fir- do, they will experience this the same way we did. Ah, no and, fun for them. I know. They're going to read the theory as written by the proponents, and then they're going to read, um, I have had to do some heavy editing of her book <laughs> yeah. because it's over the course of many chapters that she makes her arguments. Yeah. But I've had to take passages from those books to essentially bullet point the counter yeah. arguments to the theory. Ooh, you could have a fun debate. Yeah. I mean, I love it. Thanks, Kelsey. Brooke, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. See you next time. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.